Welcome back to This Week in Space. The Space Shuttle Endeavour is still on track for a wee hours launch on February 7th. NASA held its flight readiness review and cleared the orbiter for flight on Wednesday. The leaky ammonia lines on the Tranquility nodes sitting in the cargo bay have been swapped out, replaced by several smaller hoses joined together. Frankenhose, it is called. The crew of Endeavour is slated to lift off from the Kennedy Space Center on Super Bowl Sunday at 4.39 a.m. Eastern Time. That's 9.39 GMT. Think of it as a pre-pre-pre-pre-pre-game show, which of course we hope you will watch on spaceflightnow.com. I'll be joined by David Waters and Leroy Chow, and in honor of the Super Bowl, we'll have plenty of chips and dip and beer on hand. You should too. By the way, the coin that will be tossed before the big game, it comes from NASA. It flew on the Atlantis mission in November. Our coverage of the launch, not the Colts and the Saints, begins at midnight Eastern or 0500 GMT. We hope to see you then. On the heels of that widely popular tweet up at the last shuttle launch, NASA is cooking up another one for this mission. This time it will be at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. A hundred tweets and 50 backups signed up this past week, and we'll get a chance to see and tweet about the mission control on February 17th. Hopefully they will be there while Endeavour is still docked at the station. But this is a scrub or shine event, so even if there's a launch delay, the event will be pressed to tweet go. Among the tweets who will likely be twittering that day, Astro Jeff, Astro TJ, and Astro Soichi, as in station keepers, Jeff Williams, TJ Creamer, and Soichi Noguchi. This past week, NASA finally rigged up a way for them to surf the web live. The first 140 character or less bona fide tweet from space came from TJ. Hello, Twitterverse. We are now live, he said. First words, putting him somewhere between Armstrong's One Small Step for Man and Bell's Mr. Watson, come here. I want to see you. And the station is a little higher this week, courtesy of some Russian rocket propellant converted into thrust. The idea was to get the station to the sweet spot for Endeavour's arrival. And Astro Jeff, a.k.a. Jeff Williams, used that occasion to offer up a brief lesson in Newton's laws of motion using a Nikon with a big honking 800 millimeter lens. Watch what happens when controllers in Russia hit the gas to raise the station. And here it goes, it's gonna take off. I'll try not to let it hit you. Just gonna miss you. Too bad they don't have 3D cameras up there. Would have made you duck, I bet. Word this week that Russian cosmonauts have a sweet financial deal for spending some time on the International Space Station. A six-month stint on ISS is enough to earn them a nice paycheck of $150,000 worth of rubles. Not exactly a Wall Street bonus, but more than the average NASA astronaut makes in a year, whether he or she is in space or on the ground. I assume while in space, drinks and dinner are on the Russians. Ever since Spaceship One grabbed the X Prize in 2004 and Richard Branson announced his plans to sell tickets to ride into space, there's been a lot of excitement that space tourism would usher in a new era for non-governmental access to space. But it's not just well-heeled adventurers hoping for a gold-plated bungee jump. Turns out the prospect of frequent, albeit brief, trips to the edge of space have gotten some scientists spinning their wheels. You say you want a revolution in space? Well, you might be seeing the beginning of one right here. These are scientists strapping into a centrifuge, getting a taste of the rigors of spaceflight, all of them hoping they may one day be able to fly their experiments on a suborbital hop to the edge of space aboard Virgin Galactic's Spaceship Two. Civilian spaceflight may turn out to be more than a thrill-a-minute gold-plated bungee jump. Scientists see a lot of opportunities to get some thrilling results, using themselves and other passengers as guinea pigs during five minutes of weightlessness. The key to it is the price is very low and the flight rates are very high. So the real strength of this from a research standpoint is that you can go to space many times, that you can do things that we've never been able to do before. For example, atmospheric measurements every single day of the year. Scientist and former NASA Associate Administrator Alan Stern led the charge to this two-day training session. He gathered together a dozen researchers who say the suborbital rides to space will give them much easier access than the International Space Station 
and many more scientific options than airplanes that fly a roller coaster pattern to offer 30 second spurts of microgravity. There's a whole new class of science that you can do when you're offered four or five minutes of zero G. And zero G, that's a lot cleaner. That's not affected by the buffeting of the atmosphere that you're flying through. That puts you into a whole new realm of, uh, of experiment design that gives you more time to interact with that actual experiment, to poke your fingers at it, so to speak. The difference between 30 seconds and five minutes is huge. Uh, not only can you actually set up your experiment, but a lot of phenomena that have time constants take just a little bit longer than we can actually study in 30 seconds. It is the right stuff for the rest of us. Brianna Henwood manages the commercial space business here at NASTAR, the National Aerospace Training and Research Center near Philadelphia. The company has a long history simulating extreme environments for military and civilian clients, and it is the official training center for Virgin Galactic. So far, 180 would-be civilian astronauts have taken the two-day course. Initially, people are apprehensive, they're a little cautious, they're excited about doing this, but once they see the equipment involved, you know, have that apprehension and fear about getting into that piece of equipment, uh, centrifuge or an altitude chamber, to do their training. And to be clear, it is a lot more than a Disney ride. MIT aeronautical engineer Dava Newman had her motion sickness bag at the ready. Her nausea was no surprise to her, given her experience on parabola flying airplanes. For me, I always feel a little bit lighter and then the high G's that transition between low and high. Gets my stomach going a little bit. Get set, go. Besides the centrifuge, the astronaut researcher wannabes endured a scientific stress test of sorts. Hemmed into an area the same size as the Spaceship 2 cabin, they had to complete detailed tasks in five minutes or less with a host of distractions to give them a sense of what it would be like to gather data on a suborbital space mission. We're talking about five minutes of microgravity. The current asking price is $200,000. That's an easy one to figure out. $200,000 divided by five minutes equals $40,000 per minute. So, in point of fact, it really isn't any cheaper yet. Matter of fact, per minute, it's actually pretty expensive. The hope is, over time, they'll make it up on volume. I'd love to see the price point come way down below 200 k because then it will be available, actually, to educators, to students, to the general public, basically. We're trying to create a new market, a market for research and education missions on suborbital spaceflight, and at the same time, to break open spaceflight to what I call ubiquitous spaceflight. It's not even a matter of if or when now at this point. Uh, I'm now starting to begin to wonder how many times I'm going to fly into space. I would uh, love to go up. I would love to have the thrill, but I think the science is actually an incredible way to get this jump started. If you're interested in testing your own metal to see if you have the right stuff, you can buy your own training session at NASDAR for 6000 bucks. The public is invited whether or not you have plans to go to space someday. Coming up on the program, more than six years after she bounced her way onto the surface of Mars, the rover's spirit will rove no more. She's officially and permanently stuck, but that doesn't mean the mission is over. We'll talk to Spirit's daddy, Steve Squires, after a short break. <laughs>